Hey listeners, it's Paul Andriola here. Why not join our community at Small Cap Discoveries where we offer our members direct access to some of the best microcap investment opportunities available. Our members are getting access to premium microcap financings, research reports, and direct access to management. Sign up today at www.smallcapdiscoveries.com. Hi everyone, welcome to the Small Cap Discoveries conference call. Today is May 28th, 2024, and today on our call, we have the COO, Joe Thompson from Kits Eye Care. Kits trades on the TSX exchange under the symbol KITS and also trades on the OTC under KTYCF. The company is currently trading at $6.33 with about 31 million shares outstanding or about $199 million market cap. I'd now like to hand it over to Paul Andriola. Uh, thanks a lot, Trevor. Um, great to have Joe back. Uh, Joe, you're one of our favorite, certainly favorite local companies, um, but uh, you, you guys keep kind of crushing it. Um, we're always looking for companies that can generate 25% plus revenue growth. You guys just consistently keep growing. So um, love to see it, but love to have you back. Um, we're going to get into a bit of an update uh, about the business, but for those that are relatively new to the story, maybe just give us a few minutes of uh, sort of uh, business summary. Uh, what, what's Kids Eye Care all about? Sure. Well, thanks, Paul. Thanks, Trevor. Great to be back uh, on behalf of the Kids team. Uh, I'll pull up a couple of slides here to get started. Uh, you can see uh, everything okay? Perfectly. Okay, well, um, maybe just a, a quick introduction um, before we have some Q&A. Uh, the optical category, glasses, contact lenses, and eye exams is a big one, about $80 billion in North America. Uh, almost eight out of 10 adults need either glasses or contact lenses to get through the day. We think it's one of a few categories that really has not yet been disrupted at scale yet, still way too expensive, way too complicated. And so, uh, when we started kits back in 2018, uh, we did it to make eye care easy. That's our mission. Um, and we knew that to make eye care easy wouldn't be by adding more stuff um, to the category, definitely not more stores, but it would be taking away some of the waste and then passing on uh, that savings and, and tremendous quality and convenience to customers. Um, so it in about five and a half years since we started, here's our Q1. Uh, most recent results, which we disclosed uh, a number of weeks ago. Um, uh, we have revenue in Q1 of about 35 million, uh, up 26% year on year. It puts us at about 140 million revenue run rate. Um, we, from the data that we've seen, it's the fastest growing uh, company to go from zero to this size uh, in optical. Uh, so we're happy with the growth so far. Uh, that's uh, six quarters in a row of about 25 uh, plus percent growth that Paul has you outlined. Um, gross profit continues to grow uh, as well. And uh, alongside that six consecutive quarters uh, of plus around 25 percent revenue growth, we've also had six quarters of positive adjusted EBITDA. So generating cash flow from operations while funding growth well ahead of uh, of the industry. Um, and then, you know, perhaps, you know, most important for us is this reoccurring nature of, of the, the category. Once you need vision correction, you tend to need it for decades and decades. And so if you take great care of customers, the great news is they keep coming back. And so each quarter, every quarter, every year, we always want to have 60 plus percent of our revenue come from that repeat customer base. And that was true again, last quarter it was true in in 2023 and and every quarter before that and um and in q1 64 percent uh, of our revenue was coming from our active customer base which we continue uh, to add to each quarter each year um and so uh, just maybe a recap how did we get there this quickly we have some experience in the category we have some experience in e commerce when we set out we said you know there's really two secrets to this industry um, because you have to be, you have to grow quickly um, to make a difference in 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 optical. It's a big category. There's not a lot of big players. You have to quickly get to 100, really 200 million in revenue to make a difference to get leverage on the model. And we said, you know, to do so, secret number one is to start with a smaller category, contact lenses. 
which is highly reoccurring, smaller, uh, much smaller, but a, a quarter the size of eyeglasses, uh, but highly reoccurring and very profitable. A block of vision corrected customers that, oh, by the way, need to buy a pair of prescription glasses, even just to give their eyes a break for the day. So build this, um, this base of profitable vision corrected customers, and then use that profit to launch into eyeglasses. And when you do, secret number two is start with the manufacturing, start with the lab, because all of the profit on all of the cost for customers in eyeglasses is in the optical lab. Uh, and, and so if you, if you could do it the other way and, and, um, and sell a thousand, 10,000, a hundred thousand pairs of glasses and then, and then work backwards to build into manufacturing. But if you do it that way, you've really built a marketing organization or a retail organization and, and we saw potential for so much more. So those are our two secrets to quickly get to this point. We grew up it, it, uh, in truth a little faster than we anticipated um, in part because we happen to have um, this groundswell and tailwind of, of millennial customers coming into the category and really moving the category online. And so we call this really the customer of today. Um, millennials this year took over from baby boomers to be the biggest demographic in the US and Canada, uh, over 72 million consumers in the US, but 8 million in Canada. Um, and millennials this year, believe it or not, are 28 to 43 years old. And that's just prime optical age. This cohort, I mean, online is growing across all cohorts, but it's really growing in the millennial uh, cohort. This is a consumer who said, I don't want to get in my car or, or Uber um, and go to you know a lens crafters or a chem optical and pay $400 and get back in my car, wait two weeks, come back and pick them up. Um, I want broader selection. I want the best possible value and I want the convenience to do it from my home. Um, and so we knew online would grow. We just didn't realize it would grow this quickly. And that's really been driven by the millennial cohort. That millennial cohort also comes with another benefit. They, If you give them a great experience, they have a very high bar for customer experience, but if you meet it, they'll tell everyone they know about it. Um, and and the benefit to us with this approach is it allows us to grow without burdening our marketing line with, a, with an increasing number every quarter. And so if you see our revenue growth um, after the IPO, after we built out the lab um, and really started to get leverage on the model, we've seen six and we've, we've um, uh, provided some guidance that Q2 looks to be in the range of 36 to 38 million in revenue. And we expect about three to five percent adjusted EBITDA uh, in Q2. So that would be the seventh um, straight quarter of plus 20, 25 percent revenue growth and and positive adjusted EBITDA. And all of this is with um, uh, a declining reliance on on marketing spend. So marketing spend in Q1 reduced from 14.5 percent of revenue down to 13 percent. That's really driven by repeat customers, this annuity stream. And word of mouth, you give customers a great experience um, and they share the news. The last slide was an influencer who we just given what our team was a fan of and and had they provided her with free prescription glasses. We hadn't paid her, just said, Hey, we love what you're doing. You know, can we introduce you to kids and send you some free glasses? She said, sure. She posted her unboxing experience on TikTok. Um, we had a record week on glasses that week. Uh um, and um, and it, it really hasn't slowed down since then. You know, over 200,000 likes on the video. And so it was just a reinforcement. We need to do much more of, of that channel and that approach and, and put customers first in the model. As we grow with this model, we get more leverage on it and we expect to see uh, internal target, not formal guidance, but we expect to hit the 200 million revenue threshold over the course of the next two years at a run rate level. And, um, and to have um, at or approaching 40% gross margin and around 10 to 15% EBITDA, adjusted EBITDA uh, at that time. Maybe um, uh, a couple last comments before we jump into to questions, but really the central nervous system of our operation is our optical lab. We call it our, our gigafactory for optical. It's right here in Vancouver. Uh, it's a Broadway Technical Center. Uh, we can make over 4,000 pairs of prescription glasses here. It's a highly automated lab, uh, onshore, 
right next to where customers are. And this allows us um, to get customers' uh, orders manufactured and shipped the same day that they're placed. Every day, um, over half of, of customer orders are manufactured and shipped out the door the very day that they're ordered. And um, often they're in customer, customers' hands within one to two days anywhere in North America. The benefit for us of building this lab at scale is we're still growing into it. So we don't need, our CapEx has been deployed. We don't foresee needing more CapEx um, uh, for the lab uh, um, or any, any other significant CapEx requirements until we're at least 250 million, more likely 300 million. Um, and so the CapEx has been deployed and we're growing into that and getting more and more efficient as we do. And, um, uh, and maybe with that, uh, you know, I'll, I'll pause and maybe Paul, just see uh, if we could jump right into questions. Yeah, uh, appreciate it, Joel. Uh, remind everybody that's listening, if you've got a question you'd want me to ask Joel, just uh, use the chat function and, and uh, we'll do that. Um, I mean, it, it sounds like there's some real consistency here. Um, I'm not aware of any sort of bumps in the road here, but kind of what, what challenges are you facing? Maybe new challenges that, uh, that, that sort of are uh, maybe making you lose a little bit of sleep at night. What, what are you facing? Um, well, challenges, uh, you know, for us, I think the things that we're aware of that that um, it, it, are either keeping us uh, uh, awake at night or or that we're just very aware of is is you know there's a there's a tendency with growth companies um, to uh, spend more into marketing uh, and, um, and and so you know as we've talked and tried to be students of of the industry and talk to a lot of other companies out there that have, have gone through similar growth trajectory. Uh, I think, you know, the, the, the warning that they've given us is, you know, uh, resist the urge to spend into that growth. And it's very easy to say, well, you know what, maybe marketing could be 20%, 25% of revenue. We'll invest in that growth and then um, get efficiency later. Uh, and, um, uh, and uh, and so that's something definitely certainly that we're aware of. I think you know maybe the other thing is we've got the benefit of having a category move to us on the online space without a lot of competitors in mm. in pure play online. But um, but but maybe the other uh, risk to our business is we are still small until we get to that two hundred million uh, range. So um, so I, I think those are probably the biggest. Mm -hmm. You talked about marketing spend. Um, I, I looked at your balance sheet. Your, your cash position is growing quite nicely. What what do you do with uh, you know growing cash work that you've got right now? Yeah, certainly um, uh, it's nice to have cash uh, on the balance sheet right now. I think um, you know I think we you know we've maintained it in around eighteen million at the end of each quarter, somewhere kind of between eighteen to twenty million uh, cash on hand. Um, I think uh, you know. I think we'll, we'll, you know we're continue uh, continue to be happy to have a healthy balance sheet in this moment, and have cash on hand, and that gives us flexibility uh, um, as we grow and options as we grow. But um, um, lot you know, lots of opportunity for growth. I think the one thing we probably won't use that on is uh, is is um, marketing that doesn't have a clear eye to. Um, uh, you know, to, to, to generating revenue quickly. Mm -hmm. But if you, if, if we, if we look a couple of years out, you know, barring, um, you know, increased capacity, uh, sort of, um, need, uh, what do you envision spending cash on If, you know, if you guys are continuing to grow like this and, and you're not going to spend it too much on marketing, um, where else can you spend money? You know, I, I think, um, uh, it's a good question. It's something, you know, we talk about uh, quite a bit here is, you know, where, where do we invest in growth? I think there's a lot of room for growth in this, uh, in this industry um, and industry adjacent areas. So, you know, we're looking at all kinds of opportunities right now uh, to, uh, to expand our selection, uh, invest in, in um, uh, a broader range of, of eyeglasses and a broader range of selection within the category. Mm -hmm. uh, um, but then also, you know, I, we get a lot of inbound requests for adjacent categories. Like, could I get a hearing aid built into mm -hmm. my, uh, my eyeglasses? And, and so those are super interesting opportunities for us mm -hmm. that, that, you know, we're, we're certainly aware of, um, 
you know, we have talked, it's probably a good time to talk a little bit about, you know, one of uh, uh, one of the pushbacks that we've got in the public market, uh, which is a lack of liquidity on the stock. Um, mm -hmm. There's not, as you mentioned uh, uh, up front, there's not, you know, as a big insider ownership um, position, we, you know, the, the team and, and um, uh, employees own uh, about 78% of, of the total flow to the stock. And so we've, I, I, you know, I think our, I think our, our thinking has evolved a little bit on this one, and 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 maybe a year, year and a half ago, you know, probably um, when you know we were first together, we were talking about, well, you know, we need to relieve that liquidity and mm -hmm. uh, constraint, and we'll probably do an equity raise at some point, and, and you know, but not probably before we get, you know, until the issue price of eight fifty or nine dollars, mm -hmm. and. I think our thinking's really evolved from that uh, now, where um, you know we see the business growing organically at a substantial rate. The industry is growing about three to five percent. We're growing twenty-five to thirty percent. We don't mm -hmm. see any end in sight for that. So we've got an organic uh, growth business that's generating cash flow, um, adjusted EBITDA profitable, uh, and our capex has been deployed. Um, mm -hmm. And so why would we? Why would we look at raising uh, equity? We think, in our view, uh, this is a fifteen to twenty dollar uh, stock opportunity, um, and um, and so as opposed to rushing uh, to meet this concern of low liquidity, I think you know we're actually going to be happy with the mm -hmm. fact that this is a tight float, and and we're going to keep our heads down over the next quarters and years, and and just you know continue to deliver at the rate that we're delivering now, and. And the shareholders that are in the stock, um, uh, as long as we can execute and deliver, you know, we feel great about rewarding them. Mm -hmm. Is there ever any any opportunities in your space? Is that something you guys consider for M and A? Yeah, we we have. There's a lot of opportunities for M and A, um, uh, and we get a lot of inbound. Uh, the previous company that our team built, Coastal Contacts, mm -hmm. had. Had a number of acquisitions uh, along um, uh, along the path, um, and so that's certainly something that we're aware of. I think, you know, at this point, you know, we would probably uh, wait for most of the most of the companies um, that we look at are private um, and and not in the public space, and so the mm -hmm. private valuation has been a little bit slower um, to adjust and right size, and so and they're probably almost there, um, but maybe not quite. And so I think, you know, for us, we're looking for a couple things. Uh, we're focused on organic growth, number one. But as these opportunities come in front of us, uh, a couple things have to line up for us to be intrigued by them. Number one, it's got to be a creative on day one. So, mm -hmm. you know, at our current revenue run rate over the last quarter, we're at about a 1.2, 1.3 times revenue. Mm -hmm. uh, and so anything that we acquire has got to be a creative uh, on day one. And so it's got to be lower revenue multiple than that. Um, and we have to have a very high level of confidence that we can expand the back basket size uh, with those vision corrected customers and take a good percentage of the GNA to the bottom line. And, and so we're just going to be be super patient and wait for uh, the right opportunity. And, and, um, and, you know, and, and as I said, our thinking has really evolved. Uh, you know, there's, there is, um, you know, we're happy to, we have, we have cash on hand to fund uh, anything if it comes up, uh, mm -hmm. and you know we're you know, we're happy to to keep the liquidity position that we have for the foreseeable future, um, mm -hmm. and and just keep generating returns for shareholders. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm thinking now around the actual making of the product. Where like do you have any supply issues? Do you have uh, where you know where do you get your material? What's what, what's your sort of largest sort of cost input uh, for a pair of glasses? Sure. So the um, uh, the cost breakdown is pretty easy. A pair of frames on average uh, costs us, not at not every pair, some higher, some lower, mm -hmm. about, about $10. Uh, and the raw material lens pucks, um, this the big piece of, mm -hmm. of, of plastic, are uh, in around 3 to to $4. And, mm -hmm. and um the labor and uh, consumables is about the same, about three to four dollars uh, on each mm -hmm. pair, and so um, and then we've got to ship it to you. So all in, you know, we look at around a cost base 
for a high quality pair of prescription glasses that you can compare with anything um, at about $25 um, uh, cost. So the biggest cost block of that is uh, is the is the frame. Um, mm. There's a, a couple different types of materials and we source them from all over the place. There's uh, the acetate. Most of our acetate uh, comes from uh, from Italy, Mazzucchelli acetate. Um, we have metal that comes from either Italy or, uh, or, or Germany or Asia. And our hinges all come from Germany. And so, you know, this is 20 years of, of, uh, of careful um, curation of suppliers in, in, um, in eyeglasses. So our partnerships are, are very deep and, you know, and we source the best materials, um, but they're from all over the place. That's really the biggest, the biggest source would be the, the frame. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I, I couldn't help but smile. I think the last time I bought glasses, which is quite a while ago, it certainly wasn't 10 or $20 for a pair of glasses. It's <laughs> considerably more than that. So it's uh, it's amazing that that's actually your cost. Well, you know, this is actually, it's a pretty, it, it's a pretty simple market when you break it down. The problem is it's just, you have to get to such scale mm -hmm. to be able to get these efficiencies and so few people are able to get there. And as a result, customers are still paying three, $400 and mm -hmm. maybe just a couple points on, on that comment, Paul, that, you know, there's, there's a, there's two areas in particular where customers are spending more and, and, and they certainly can continue to spend more, or mm -hmm. they now have the option to spend less. The first is in-store versus online. Mm -hmm. You know, we estimate um, the customer, someone's got to pay for all that that brick and mortar infrastructure and the inventory, double inventory, triple inventory pools um, that are in every brick and mortar location and the labor, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And we estimate those those brick and mortars are selling on average five to ten pairs of prescription glasses a day. And um, and so the cost, which gets passed on to the customer, is about $150 per pair, um, just you know, to go into a brick and mortar store to have mm -hmm. that option. And so that's part one. And part two is most of these um, optical sh shops are outsourcing the lens manufacturing to mm -hmm. another lab, maybe even us. Uh, we do some B2B work uh, with our excess capacity. And so on average, those uh, um, uh, those stores are paying about $100 uh, more than they could uh, if they were doing the lab work themselves uh, per mm -hmm. pair. And so that's about $250 that a customer is paying just for two simple uh, things, uh, not not shopping in store and um, and shopping uh, at kits where they know we make in Vancouver every pair of prescription glasses that goes out, um, and our and and that's why we price every pair of kits glasses at twenty eight dollars. That's amazing. That's amazing. I'm uh, I'm actually I'm going to be in the market market for a couple pair of glasses here next week, a couple of weeks. So you're, you're going you're gonna to see a new customer here pretty quickly. Um, a couple of questions that have come in here. I might as well tackle them right now. Um, Jeremy asks, can, can China compete with your price delivered? Um, I, I imagine, I mean, you, you guys are using, I'll say automation. I can't imagine it being very labor intensive what you're doing, but maybe correct me if I'm wrong. It's a very important question, um, so I'm, I'm glad it came up. Our our cost of labor, um, which is really the differentiator in, at a uh, at a scale um, facility, a scale lab in in China, mainland China versus Vancouver, our cost uh, in labor is about three to four dollars. And so, let's say uh, in um, overseas that could be one dollar. Let's yeah, it's probably more like a dollar fifty, but let's say a dollar. Um, so that's two dollars that they're saving um, per pair on labor, uh, and um, the 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 other cost inputs are are very comparable. Um, and so uh, what uh, the trade off they have to make is they've got to ship it overseas every pair. And so um, the the overseas and and if you order a pair and it's manufactured in 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 mainland and then shipped over to you, it can't come uh, via ocean freight. It's got to come by air. So you know, the way that we've looked at it and the calculations that we've made is the overseas air transit negates the cost benefits of labor and um, and also improves the time to customer by seven to 14 days. And, and we know this because we compare with another very good competitor that's like-minded to, to us, a competitor called zenny.com. Um, uh, and they're mostly in the U.S., um, 
uh, market and and they're glasses only and they really compete at the low end of the category it's the quality of of uh of materials isn't isn't as high as what you'll find on kits but they do an excellent job at getting to scale um for the low the the customer that's looking for a pair of eight or ten dollar prescription glasses and they do that by manufacturing in a super lab out in um uh, uh, just a big lab outside of Guangzhou. Um, and so we see, you know, the delivery times that, uh, um, that, 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 that results in, which is, you know, which is too often, uh, 14 to 15 business days versus, you know, our goal is every uh, customer gets their order in inside of two business days. And then of course, if there's any back and forth, that's done very quickly as well. Mm -hmm. Um, so Jeremy asked another question, which he, he kind of touched on. He, he, he says, uh, do you do you do any white label business? So it, it sounds like you do do some contract manufacturing for others. We do. Uh, we have a, a, a part of the business called uh, Fulfillment by Kits. Uh, my background before, you know, Roger and I um, uh, embarked on, on starting uh, Kits. Uh, I was at Amazon down in Seattle and, and Fulfillment by Amazon worked at very well for us and and so um it was a great way to grow into our scale um mm -hmm. and to to build the best infrastructure in the market but then not have to bear the full cost of mm -hmm. of of building it yourself um give others the opportunity to participate in that infrastructure and and mm -hmm. also uh the opportunity to fund it um you know fulfillment by kids won't be as big as fulfillment by amazon but it, it's it's certainly been um, a margin and creative, uh, productive way for us to use this capacity before, as we grow into it. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's a small part of our business, very productive. Um, we like the economics of it, um, but but that will never be our our, mm -hmm. our focus. It's um, uh, our focus and our opportunity is to form a direct partnership with the customer and and build that partnership over decades. Mm -hmm. What what percentage would you say your your current fulfillment uh, pieces of your overall business? You know we don't we don't break it out. It's mm -hmm. uh, it's not it's not a it's not a uh, it's not a sizable uh, percentage oh, of the true. business, and mm -hmm. and that's you know it's really been by design. Uh, we've you know been very choiceful and and partnered with a number of chains, um, uh, and um, uh, in largely on the west coast here, and mm -hmm. a number of chains you'd probably recognize that. Uh, that we do all the lab work for and and it's really just finding folks that are like-minded with us mm -hmm. not folks that you know are going to use our our lab and then you know pass on you know two three hundred percent um mm -hmm. uh costs to customers and take all the margin to themselves but but partners that you know that we know will, that will really reinforce what we're trying to do in this in this industry which is um, make make um, make eye care easy for mm. for Canadians. Mm -hmm. Joe, what what do, you, what do you think is the end game here? I mean, you guys have been successful. Certainly, Roger is successful in selling uh, some past businesses. Is that the same sort of idea here? Do you get bought by somebody else? You, you know, certainly um, there'll be there'll be plenty of opportunities uh, for that. I think you know maybe what I would share is is uh, on our thinking is. Um, it's a commonly um, uh, common belief with Roger and myself that, you know, if, if Coastal Contacts was still in business now, it would be a multi-billion dollar a company. Now, certainly that was, an, you know, a fantastic outcome for shareholders, for employees, for everybody involved. Um, it's, it's our view that, um, that uh, there's even more to be done now. Um, and as the market is moving online, it's, you know, the market's right in front of us. So, in this moment, um, you know, our capex is deployed. Uh, our organic growth opportunities are significant. If we choose M and A as an option uh, for further growth, either in North America or beyond, um, and so there's no way that we would stop at a half a billion dollars, which is the the coastal contacts um, uh, exit uh, price of about 450 million in cash. I think. You know, it's our view that you know this is a business we you know be happy to hand over to our kids one day and um, and just you know continue to watch grow. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Um, what what what's what should investors look forward to in the next little while? Like what what sort of milestones or catalysts do you think uh, uh, you could see in the next year or so? 
You know, I think the you know, the the um, organic growth rate is uh, and cash flow generation and having that continue is just every quarter that we're able to hear um, and you know from we have six sell side analysts that cover us now and and every time we you know that investors read their reports and see uh, met and exceeded top line met and exceeded bottom line it's just a it, it's another vote of confidence in in a small cap that um, isn't burdened by um, by debt, uh, a very small debt position, about $6 million in, uh, with the BDC that's due to pay off at any point, but 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 it'll be fully paid off at Q2 2026. Um, and I, I, was, I was on a call with the U.S. Bank this morning, and, um, and they were sharing that in the U.S. microcap uh, environment, there's $450 billion of debt that's coming due just this year in 2024. And so, you know, there's, there's so much focus now on, on debt, um, mm -hmm. on getting to profitability, on restructuring, on re-strategizing the operation and right sizing and so much of a cognitive load of a team and of a, a leadership team and an organization can go into that, especially if there's things like you know, like layoffs tied to that. Mm -hmm. I think what investors can look forward to with kits is it's a very simple, straightforward business. Um, we've created an asset light model and the market is moving to us in, in the online space. And so we're not going to run out of market share. We're going to continue to look at organic growth. Um, we're aware that liquidity is uh, a concern for some folks, but for the folks that that are investors in the stock, it, it shouldn't be a concern at all um, because uh, in 2023, Kits was the top performing consumer stock on the TSX. And, you know, it's our expectation that we're, you know, at the top of that list uh, this year and, and next year as well. So just more um, uh, a straightforward organic growth focus, uh, generating cash flow from operations and, and just a consistent pattern of, of, meeting and exceeding expectations on, on top and bottom line and, and a simple story and a category that's not discretionary. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, music to my ears. I mean, that's, that's the sort of stuff that we always strive for is to find something that consistently just keeps doing the right things. Um, th there were two questions that sort of slipped in here, or maybe three here. L let's ask those and then uh, we can sort of look to wrap up here. Um, so, so we've got, we've got somebody from the UK and he asked in the UK, I thought lenses were more expensive than the frames, particularly for multifocal. Um, is this different for you guys? Yeah, it, it's a very important question. Um, so the raw, I was talking about the raw material costs, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. certainly for the consumer in everywhere in every region in the world, lenses are the most e expensive part. And mostly because the lens work is outsourced to a third-party lab, which charges outrageous prices uh, to the independent optical retailer, who then pass them on to the customer. So multifocal or digital progressive lenses are prime examples of that. Uh, and uh, the way a digital progressive lens works is it, it'll have either two or three um, uh, different prescriptions within the lens. And so we uh, surface and coat and edge that uh, lens as it goes through. Now, in a, in a traditional brick and mortar store in, in North America, I'm not sure about the UK, the price of digital progressives is often 800 to to $1,000 or in some cases, much more. Um, and on, on kits.com and kits.ca, our price is $98. Again, because we do it all ourselves. That, that, and, and that is the fastest growing part of our um, of our glasses business, uh, digital uh, progressives um, uh, grew 55 percent year on year in in the last quarter, and you know we just we see even more growth, you know, coming uh, in the year ahead. So, um, yeah, the the question is exactly the right one. The the cut uh, from a customer standpoint, customers uh, have experienced the lenses costing much, much more um, than the frames. Mm -hmm. In truth, from a raw material standpoint, now we're at a, a decent amount of scale. We sold, you know, about uh, 300,000 pairs of prescription glasses last year. You know, I'd expect those, you know, we'll probably sell 500,000 this year. And so we get great, we design all the glasses, all the kids' glasses ourselves, and we get great, great economies of scale. 
on those, but um, but the frame is about ten dollars on average, and uh, and the raw material lens puck is three to five dollars. There there is opportunities to upgrade. We have the full suite of of lens pucks. You could get a super thin lens, or um, uh, gaining popularity now is photochromatic, uh, where the the lenses that change from light to dark as you go inside and outside. Uh, in mass blue blocking tint uh, is another popular one, um, uh, and so we're you know we're fortunate we've got you know the, probably the widest selection of of lenses uh, in in the region here, and uh, we're happy to just pass out those savings on to customers no matter what they're looking for. That's awesome. That's amazing. Um, and then I even asked I think to ask this question before, but you guys are uh, do you do any business in Europe? I mean, do you predominantly North America or how, do, how does it look internationally? Yeah, it's predominantly North America. We do we do get the occasional order in from Europe and, and beyond, but it's about 70% of our business is in the U.S., and about 30% in Canada. Canada's grown a little bit faster on a smaller base. It's grown about mm -hmm. 40 to 45% in the last two quarters, um, uh, but uh, but predominantly North America. Mm -hmm. and, and any any plans to look at Europe as a, as a market? Yeah, I think um, you know probably through M and A would be the right mm -hmm. way to come into those markets. Coastal had a very productive European mm -hmm. business, um, and and you know we certainly think um, our view anyway is that North America is the most competitive market um, globally, uh, and um, and this this the kits model seems to work pretty well here, and so we think the model travels fairly well. Um, there's a couple different ways that we've contemplated. You know, entering you know parts of Europe or or elsewhere. Mm, gotcha. And and then sort of last question uh, from the audience here, Russell asks, where did the name Kits come from? <laughs> well, <laughs> I think I know. <laughs> I'll let you answer. Uh, uh, yeah, there's there's an area here in Vancouver called yeah. Kitsilano, and and Kits Beach is kind of the equivalent of I guess a Bondi Beach. You know, somewhere else. It's really. I mean, Paul, you correct me if you feel differently, but I think, you know, Kids Beach is really the heartbeat of the city. Yeah. And, um, you know, Roger and I were, it, when we were starting early 2018, putting together um, uh, what the business could look like, we, we were meeting for coffee at a coffee shop on Kids Beach. Uh, and because you can't build a business, you know, in a boardroom, you have to get out and, and talk to people and, and, um, and and get out into the world and and so we would meet every day at this coffee shop on kids beach and so the idea came along why why not call it uh why not call the company kids alano um uh, you know for kids beach and so we thought we were very clever and then uh, we realized nobody outside of vancouver uh, recognized or could spell kids alano and so we <laughs> very quickly shortened it to kids uh, yeah. uh kids.com in, in the u.s kids.ca in canada and and lo and behold, uh, that coffee shop um, uh, yeah. announced that that uh, that it was closing um, uh, uh, a few years ago, and so um, and so we opened our one and only kids store in in that location. And it, it's uh, uh, have have you been yet, Paul, to that location? I haven't yet. No, I haven't. We should. It, but... we, we, let's record the next one of these from the kids location. We'll do it's that. A super fun, right on the beach. Uh, it's yeah. a coffee shop. Uh, it's an event space, uh, and um, and and we we also sell a lot of glasses there as well. Yeah, no, you'll you'll see me there for sure. Um, just just as we wrap up here, is there anything we missed, or or what my, what would be the uh, key message you want to make sure everybody walks away with today? You know, we're we're uh, we're just happy, you know, to have the opportunity to share the story. It's you know we've. Um, we we have small team here, and so we're probably not out there as as much as as maybe other small caps um, in the space and in, in communicating the story. Um, uh, we um, we you know we just prefer to keep our heads down, and and we we love this business, we love this industry, and it's just fun for us to work in it every day. Um, so we're you know we're grateful to have the opportunity. Uh, here and um, and at your next in-person conference to uh, to break away and come and, and talk about the story. Um, but really, I, it's not really about the story for investors. It's you really can believe the story as an investor if you try Kits as a customer. 
And so what, you know, what I'd probably say to, you know, the folks on, on the call here, and I appreciate your time um, to listen um, to, to what we're building. You know, it's hard, it's hard to imagine, you know, just over five years ago that we'd have folks that would want to hear about, uh, uh, about the stuff uh, that we were excited about. But what I would say is, you know, if you're, if you're considering be, uh, being an investor of kits, um, I'd encourage you to be a customer first and, and go to kits.ca in Canada or kits.com and, and try on a pair of glasses and try us out. And, and, and ultimately that, that experience, um, and, um, hopefully is, is the, uh, is, is all that you need to believe in, um, in where we're headed and, and the opportunity that's in front of us. Fantastic. Uh, Joe, it's always great to get caught up. Um, continued success. It's always great to see a local company do as well as you guys are doing. And uh, like I said, you, you guys are fulfilling sort of the criteria that we look for. So it's always nice to see a company that we can point to and say, hey, look at these guys. Um, we've been speaking with COO Joe Thompson, uh, Kits Eye Care. Uh, symbol is K-I-T-S on the TSX. Uh, Joe, until the next time, uh, really appreciate it and look forward to uh, catching up and, and looking forward to coming visit you at the, uh, at the, at the Kits uh, site. We're gonna have we're gonna crowdsource a pair of glasses for you. I think we're gonna end up with a nice big bright pair of red. Uh, Elton John and Elton John uh, glasses. glasses. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Trevor. Thanks, Thank everyone. you, Joe. Bye now.